Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to our slash petty revenge, where people get wins on others, and the revenges are so freaking satisfying. And in today's episode, guys, OP gets tormented by his Karen boss, only to find out that she's hiding deep, dark secrets. Guys, I hope you enjoy today's super satisfying stories, and as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. So I'm single again, after three years. Now this is relevant because my ex-boyfriend exacted his own petty revenge by cutting down the willow tree where we first kissed. We had ducked under the branches that formed a sort of yellow-green umbrella, almost completely blocking out the rest of the world. It was an incredibly romantic moment, and I think more than anything else, I'm mad at how that was ruined for me by his stupid move. I forwarded his text bragging about it right to the property owner of the fourplex we lived in. But that's not the petty revenge, or at least not all of it. A couple of weekends later, I saw him out in the garden with a bunch of tools. He had some kind of roto-tiller thingy that he used to get rid of the stump, and also a pickaxe, shovels, etc. I learned later that in lieu of being sued and or arrested, the landlord made him clear off the remains of the old tree, excavate the stump, and plant a new willow tree in its place. He also had to pay them some money as well, but I have no way to confirm how much. So here's the petty revenge. After an entire day of grinding, picking, digging, hauling dirt, etc., he got pretty mucked up. Being the idiot he was, he decided to come up and ask if he could shower off before leaving. And I said, and you can quote me on this, F no. And so, my a-hole ex had to put his mud and sweat covered ass into his pristine Dodge Ram something pickup that he treats like it's made out of cotton wool and needs to be kept in plastic sleeves like it's a rare Pokemon card. I watched his lame attempt at putting old newspaper down on the seat, only to drop a thousand F-bombs after he noticed the newsprint was rubbing off on his white leather seats. Now it didn't make up for the loss of a beautiful tree, or how he poisoned one of the best memories I had of our relationship, but it did help confirm that dumping his ass was the right decision. Guys, what a freaking idiot. And all I can think of is that poor willow tree. Like, people who spite murder trees are horrible people, and this guy's lucky the landlord didn't sue him for a replacement. And also, why buy a truck if you're scared to get it dirty? This was a few years ago now, but I find it fun to think about. I'm not sure if it belongs here. So, I started dating at 15 years old, I moved in together at 18, and within 6 months of living together, she cheated on me. She also owed me something like $800 for one month's rent and a vet bill I paid for. We still lived together for 6 months after we broke up. Cause despite me being able to move back home, she expected me to move out and to also continue paying my portion of rent. Now it did suck, but it sucked less than paying for her to have her own place. The TV slash internet bill was in her name. We had cable. The fact that she owed me money was documented via email. I very strategically sent many emails asking her to confirm that she was aware she owed me money and how much. I also asked if we could just deduct my portion of the cable bill from the debt she owed me. On the second last month of our lease, she was hounding me from my portion of the internet bill. About $30. She wouldn't take no for an answer and threatened to not pay and have it turned off. I had another roommate in school who needed it, so I paid my part. By this time, she was staying with the man she cheated on me with, so she wasn't really around ever. For some reason, when she moved all her stuff out, she left the cable box and the Wi-Fi router. I guess assuming that I was still paying for slash using it. I brought my own TV to use. After her and her new boyfriend came in one day and took her TV without saying anything while I was actively watching it with a Tinder hookup. That was an awkward night. I knew I was never getting my money back, so I had an idea. I would buy every channel that exists. All extras I could buy, just with a four-digit pin. Before this, I emailed her one last time, saying something like, just to confirm, my portion of this month's bill will be subtracted from X amount you owe me, correct? And she agreed. These purchases began a week or two before I moved back in with my parents. I bought every channel individually, bought and rented movies, even paid for pay-per-view porn subscriptions because I thought it was hilarious. I kept track of everything I purchased and racked the bill up to almost exactly how much money she owed me, leaving a bit of space in case I miscalculated. About $750. When she got the bill, I was back with my parents and she came to my parents' house with a bill in hand. 
My father answered the door. She meekly stated something like, Your son spent so much on this bill, I can't afford it. To which my father responds, Use the money you owe him to pay for it. And then he closed the door on her. I was listening and out of sight. Whether or not she ended up having to pay, I'll never know. But it felt good to do it at the time. Guys, what a brilliant revenge by OP. And yes, if it's under her name, for sure she had to pay it. Guys, cable companies are relentless when it comes to collecting what they're owed. And the thing is, if she puts it off long enough, it'll affect her credit score. And if she refuses to pay it and lets it go to collections, well, that's even worse. Again, what an awesome play by OP. When my wife and I were starting out, we had a little old rental house downtown that we leased to male students. When we moved out of the country for a job, I figured it would be easier to rent to one family rather than chase around six separate broke students for rent. The first family we put in there turned out to be a bad choice on my part. Misty, a 40-year-old female, was fine for the first four months or so. When I visited in person, the house was noticeably getting gross. They weren't taking care of things. This might have been somewhat forgivable, but then Misty stopped paying rent on time. To make matters worse, there was a plumbing issue that sounded expensive. The toilets were backing up, and sewage was soaking the carpets in the basement. The whole place stank, and I didn't even know why. The plumber ran a camera down the pipes to see what was happening. He informed me that the clog was a result of a buildup of needles. You know, the kind one might use for drugs. I opted to pay $1,000 to have them use high pressure to flush out the system. Unfortunately, my house was nearly 100 years old, so the high pressure destroyed the clay connector to the city's sewage system. The only way to fix it was to shut down a major residential road, and to dig to it for $30,000. Insurance wasn't in any hurry to pay either. I didn't have that kind of cash sitting around at the moment, and Misty was still in there. I wanted to evict Misty, but it would be a long process, and I knew she would fight tooth and nail to stay as she didn't want to go back to her parents, who lived just down the street. By this point, my house resembled a hoarder's home, and I suspected that drugs were being dealt there. So rather than evicting Misty, I called the health department because they were living with no running water and a porta potty they rented in the backyard. It was gross. They also had two girls there, under the age of 10. It took a visit from a team of sheriffs to get her out, and only well after, the property was condemned. When Misty finally did leave, she left about 100 pounds of rotting meat on the front lawn. She also left the house a giant mess, and she stole many of my things. I was so relieved that she was gone that I almost didn't care. She was a major source of stress in my life and in my marriage. It ended up taking several hundred hours and over $50,000 to fix up the house. Eventually, insurance did come through for a part of it. I tried not to be resentful of the situation because being a drug addict and living in a condemned building is its own hell. There wasn't anything I could feel good about doing to her. She was already doomed to live poorly based on her own choices. By this point in life, I felt like I was above petty revenge. Besides, she had two kids. Oddly though, Misty had the gall to text me to ask for a referral for a new place, since she didn't have anyone else. At that, I was dumbfounded, but I texted back a thumbs up. Maybe I could save the next guy. Eventually, I did get the call from the next guy asking about Misty. The guy was an a-hole to me on the phone though. He was talking over me and talking down to me. The guy was an expert landlord doing his due diligence, etc. I tried to get my story about Misty in, but then I paused. I listened to him talk down to me some more, and then I waited until it was my turn. I told him, you know what, Misty was great, I had some major plumbing issues, otherwise she would still be with me. Also, she's got a really cute family. Treat me with disrespect, good luck with Misty, you two deserve each other. Misty got the place, and she texted back and thanked me. I never heard from either of them again. Yeah, so that was a turn I didn't expect, guys. Like, who thought OP was going to get revenge on Misty? I sure as heck did. But I'll be completely honest with you, the a-hole caller getting his place potentially trashed is much more satisfying. I hope Misty comes through, guys. I really do. So my neighbor's son Garth graduated college about this time last year, and he got his first full-time career job at a company. He's in the IT department of a branch office, and he does IT things. The total number of employees at this office is around 20. Some are sales, some work in the office, and Karen is the office manager. When Garth first started, there were three IT people. 
They had an office in the basement, away from the rest of the employees. This suited Garth just fine. He's quiet, introverted, highly intelligent, but he's not a social person. He would rather spend his time off gaming than live interaction. As you can imagine, he's not a big kid, maybe a buck fifty after eating a big steak for dinner. The two other IT people eventually move on to other jobs and corporate doesn't replace them. Now Garth has three times the work without receiving a raise. Of course, Garth voices his concerns to Karen about the workload and callouts, and he gets the standard feeble corporate response and condescending lecture. I don't know why he didn't quit then, but he stuck it out, hoping to eventually be recognized for his worth, etc. Whenever I spoke with him, he would say how bad it was working for Karen. But his saving grace was he was in his solitary office most of the day, and he didn't have much contact with her. Until one day back in February, he gets a phone call from Karen telling him to come upstairs. Upon arriving, he's directed to start moving furniture around. Garth takes a look around and tells Karen that his job does not call for moving heavy objects. That's when Karen gets loud and calls his manhood into question in front of everyone. But Garth does not budge. So life did change for him after that. Karen had decided to make work miserable for him. Karen started repeatedly writing him up, for whatever reason she could think up, trying to get him fired over and over again. And here comes the petty revenge. Garth starts snooping and discovers that Karen, a married woman, is having an affair with a married co-worker. Their phones are synced up to the computer system, which Garth has access to. Garth then creates a massive corporate email with various screenshots of the explicit text. He rigged it to be sent out today from her own email account. And the beauty of it all is Garth walked in Friday and he handed in his resignation to corporate HR. He left his ID card and whatever else on Karen's desk, and Karen's made a big deal of shouting to Garth as he was leaving to not let the door hit him in the ass on the way out. When the email sent out, they may well suspect that Garth was the perpetrator, but they'll never be able to prove it. I can only hope that Garth's revenge is sweet and spectacular, and I can only hope that Karen loses her job and her marriage is destroyed after that. I've said this before guys, be careful who you pick on, especially if they're an IT guy. And seriously, why? Why would you send those kinds of texts at work of all places? And on a company phone for goodness sakes, it's like she deserves this. My roommates are vegetarian and they always eat my food. Our lease is almost up and I'm moving out in a couple of weeks anyways. So a couple of weeks ago, I got some cheese bread from a pizza place and I only had a few pieces. I left the rest in the fridge so I could have it when I got home from work the next day. The next day, I get home, grab the box of cheese bread and open it and my roommates left me one piece. Mind you, I ate only a few pieces the previous day, so I had more than half remaining. That's when I asked if they ate it, and they admitted to it because they were drunk. They almost always eat my food, if it can fit their vegetarian diet, and they never ask me. Just a few months ago, I bought 10 boxes of mac and cheese because they were on sale for 10 for $10. They ate 8 boxes, and I only had 2. This was supposed to be a last resort option for me when I didn't have enough money or didn't feel like making food, and they never once offered me any of my food when they made it. So today, I went and got some pizza, bread, and wings. I already know they're gonna eat the pizza and just take the meat off. However, I ended up getting stuffed cheese bread and I asked if they could put pepperoni inside of it. The restaurant agreed. So now, I'm just waiting until my roommates get home, eat my stuff without asking me, so I can enjoy the satisfaction of telling them that they ate meat. Don't eat my food if you're not gonna ask. F around and you will find out. Guys, I just hate food thieves. Like, nothing annoys me more than someone just eating someone else's food. Especially without asking them. Opie does come back with an update that says, I just got home from work. Both of them were in the kitchen as I walked through the door, so I figured it's the perfect opportunity to grab the box of my pepperoni stuffed cheese bread. I open the box and look at them in the face and just kind of stare at them quietly looking shocked. One said, oh yeah, I ate a piece of your bread last night. So I proceed to ask my other roommates if they had a piece as well. They also said they had a couple of pieces. That's when I put my head down a bit and said, bro. And their response was, I'll pay you for it if you want. To which I respond, uh, I'm not worried about you paying me, but how the F did you not realize that there was pepperoni in it? 
They both just stare at me and say, what? You're lying. That's when I pulled apart the bread, revealing the pepperoni, and they both look dumbfounded. Then one of them proceeds to ask me, why the F didn't you tell us there was meat in this? And I just responded with, why the F do you eat my food without asking me first? If you would have been thoughtful and asked me, you would have known there was meat. Next time, don't touch my stuff without asking. They were both still kind of shocked, so I go to the fridge and grab one of their white claws out of the drawer. And one roommate says, what happened to not taking stuff without asking? And I just respond with, think of it as reimbursement for always taking my stuff. And then I walked away and went to my room to type this. Yeah, so a lot of people are commenting that OP's roommates are fake vegetarian guys. And more like broke roommates. Calling them out and saying that picking pepperoni off of pizza and eating it, claiming you're vegetarian is stupid. Because all the meat juice has soaked into the cheese and bread. Guys, let me know what you think. So I've had my phone number for 5 years, maybe 6, I don't remember exactly. When I got this number, the previous owner still got regular messages and phone calls, which is completely understandable. That she didn't have everyone up to date on the newest number, or lack of number. The first 3 months, it was nothing to me. I would answer the calls and send them on their way. Well, that was until I got one phone call from an elementary school, looking for, let's call her Sarah. Now Sarah's daughter was throwing up and running a high fever and needed to go home. I told the school that this was a new number for me and there was no Sarah around. I thought certainly the issue would make her come to the realization that she needed to update her number. But no, I had to block the school's number because I continued to get texts and calls that had way too much information about Sarah's daughter including her name, age, and school events with times and changes in school schedules. I wasn't comfortable receiving that info, so I blocked it. Maybe two or three weeks after I blocked the school, Sarah's grandmother calls me because I assume the school couldn't get a hold of Sarah. But I have to tell grandma that I'm not Sarah and to please ask her granddaughter to update her information. Sarah still did not. With all the information that I unwillingly had on Sarah, I found her on Facebook and kindly asked her to not use her old number anymore. I'm not sure if she saw the message or not, but it didn't help my problem. This has been ongoing for years, and it's not just spam. It's people she knows, like coworkers, family, doctors, her real estate agent even. So before, if she had appointments that were asking to be verified via text to my phone, I would just ignore them. But she had an appointment this time, and I was just so fed up of Sarah still giving out this number after 5 years, that I cancelled her appointment on her. A few days later, a new appointment to the same place needed verification, and I cancelled that again. And the next one I got will be cancelled also. Get your crap together, Sarah. How does that woman function is my question. And you'd think that your child's school would be one of the first places you'd update your contact information at. Like, it's absolutely wild that after all those years, OP was still getting calls. Like, I feel that OP should just become Sarah at this point. So this occurred back in the late 2000s in Iraq. I was a mere squad leader, just bebopping along, trying not to accidentally go boom. I had two team leaders and six soldiers under me. So for those who struggle with math, that makes eight, which is irrelevant information. In any event, one day, we were tasked with looking for things that go boom. Well, we didn't find it because it found us. And it was the worst of the things that can explode on you. An EFP, an explosively formed projectile. Which, once it penetrates the armor, it's like being trapped in a confined space with a red-hot porcupine. If you don't die from the heat, but that's neither here nor there. We had been hit by three at one time. Well, one hit and went right under my seat and clear through the other side. Another hit the engine, while the third managed to hit the tail of the RG-33. I regained consciousness after maybe two minutes or so. I come to, feeling the 50 cal rocking the truck and brass occasionally hitting me. My gunner was getting busy, turning the trigger man into an orangish red mist and returning fire. I assessed the damage and confirmed that no one was seriously injured and I tried to call out. Well surprise surprise, my radios were trashed. 
And apparently, some idiot at BN thought we were killed in action because apparently, they saw the whole thing by drone. It took me a bit to get a backup radio working because it too took a beating. And I could barely see through the black gray smoke and we were actively engaged and laughing our asses off. I finally popped a smoke to signal that we were good. And shortly after that, I got back on the radio. Unfortunately, this triggers a blackout so no communication to the US for at least three days. So word gets back to a certain dependa in the FRG, which is essentially a bunch of nosy slash gossipy dependapotamuses determined to create drama. Now, this particular Karen dependa considers herself the queen dependa, and all others were her subjects. She had caused plenty of stress prior to this event, but I don't care because I don't like drama, and I was busy trying not to die. Anyways, the Queen Dependa took it upon herself to tell A's wife that he was dead, which is a big no-no, especially off hearsay. And three of her friends even told her to let the military handle it, because it's the proper way, and because she was going off hearsay. For three days, A's wife thought that her husband was dead, except he was very much alive. Needless to say, when we finally found out, we were pissed. His wife was of course happy and confused and pissed simultaneously. I mean, the emotional roller coaster must have been insane. I made a few phone calls to some of the wives that were cool, and my prior service friend, who I called Winky because she lost an eye from an IED the previous deployment. This fearless gaggle would initiate Operation Hot Pocket. I just needed a workable plan, as Hot Pockets could only get my ninjas in. Now after some digging, I learned that this particular Karen Dependa enjoyed various illicit substances, as well as copious amounts of food. And generally, I don't care because it doesn't affect me, but we're out for blood now. My insiders went to the Dependa's house with Hot Pockets to partake in some of the said illicit substances which are now illegal. They were quite friendly to Queen Dependa, stroking her massive ego that was only dwarfed by her physical size. And they learned where her stash was and managed to move some to strategic obvious locations. The following day, A's wife went to confront the Dependa as planned with the intention of goading the Dependa Queen into hitting her in front of uninvolved witnesses. Well, it went off without a hitch, which got the police involved, where to no surprise, a good amount of illicit substances were found. So the Dependa was charged with multiple felonies. Apparently, she had quite the assortment, and she was in jail upon our return six months later. As for the idiot who initiated the entire ordeal, we couldn't ever positively identify them, so we couldn't in good faith act. As for A and his wife, they later divorced, before getting remarried to each other when he was discharged a few years later. I suspect that event played a large role. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash petty revenge. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, it's on our slash I don't work here lady episode, where a Karen attacks OP in front of cameras, guys. It's so ridiculous. So go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie will see you guys in the next one. We love you.